Well, welcome to welcome back actually to our uh, Friday Lunch and Learn series. Um, I am absolutely delighted to introduce you to a, uh, a wonderful human being and an exceptional leadership coach, Ms. Michelle Sales. Um, Michelle is absolutely passionate about uh, helping people to maximise and fulfil their potential, both in leadership but also um, in their own lives. Uh, for over 28 years, she held uh, corporate executive roles, um, predominantly within the uh, financial services sector and, and environment, um, before opening, opening her own consulting practice in, in 2012. Um, I've had the great pleasure of working personally with Michelle over the last kind of couple of years and, uh, and uh, Michelle working with my team, so I can absolutely vouch for the, uh, for the wonderful work and, um, and style of leader that, that she is. Um, highly experienced coach. I think Michelle would say um, over the years started to see some trends and threads uh, appearing through the conversations that she was having with leaders, uh, which led her on to write her absolutely wonderful book, um, which is called uh, The Power of Real Confidence and Learning sorry, learn how to lead to your full potential. And it was uh, great when we were able to travel and commute and I would be at uh, Melbourne Airport and see Michelle's smiling face with uh, numbers of books sitting, sitting underneath. So uh, it's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful uh, read for sure. Um, and uh, I'm absolutely thrilled that she's able to join us today because I think what we're noticing is in this current environment, and we're not going to labour on the situation, we're all in it, um, but how can we use this opportunity of the pause, as I guess we're, we're kind of describing it, to, uh, to bounce forward? Uh, for those who haven't been on our webinars before, what we'll do is we'll uh, break at a number of points through the webinar so that we can respond to your Q&A. So please do use the Q&A or chat box and, uh, and at that stage I'll um, hand over to Michelle. Welcome. Thanks Jo. Thanks, thanks for having me today and um, thanks for those who are on live acknowledging that it's Friday and a gorgeous day and before a long weekend. So <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, as Joe said, more and more the conversation now is turning to what our opportunity is in front of us and what our lives are going to look like professionally and personally. Um, in a post-COVID environment. And so today I want to set a little bit of context, but mostly talk about what that opportunity could look like, um, but how we get ourselves in the right state to be able to respond to that. Um, and so the three things that I'll spend time talking about is, is building our confidence so that we are in the best possible state and really amping up our curiosity and our compassion. Because what we know is whilst we've talked in terms of leadership skills um, and the requirement for us as leaders to be adaptive and resilient and creative um, and have great empathy, those skills are going to be increasingly important. Um, and so getting ourselves in a state to be able to, to lead effectively and respond effectively is really important. Um, I love this when, if I just spend a minute talking about a little bit of context, I love this um, tweet that went viral from uh, the Canadian federal government that has kind of, I think, captured so well of the environment that we've been in. Uh, we're not, we haven't been working from home in any kind of typical way. Um, we are at home during a crisis and trying to work. Um, and for many, many people, that's also meant trying to homeschool children and um, manage relationships differently and a whole lot of other roles that we've had. Um, so I would say if I think about all of the many conversations and sessions that I've run over the last few months, the most often used um, phrase that I've heard is this roller coaster that um, we've all been on um, and whilst we can um, pretty readily now talk about some of the, the benefits and the opportunities that um, this period has afforded us. It's also very clear that the challenges have been very real and still continue to be. 
Um, the fact that our personal, our physical, mental and emotional health is the most important thing. So how we sustain ourselves and, uh, and if possible, optimise ourselves during this period is very critical. Um, points three and six there, I think, you know, we, we spoke about early on, but have been so important that the blurred lines and the blurred boundaries um, that we have trying to operate from home has been difficult. And so very often people that I've been talking to that have been finding it quite difficult are compensating and doing a lot of extra hours um, because success can't be measured the same way. Um, and some of that will continue on for us. And to be kind to ourselves and to kind to others is, uh, is, has been and will continue to be very important. Um, let me just flick forward. I'm just having a little mouse problem. Um, I reflect interestingly on this extrapolation bias. So um, for anyone who saw the last AFR mag, um, there was a reflection on this. Um, in there, and this is this stems from the finance and investment um, space, and it's a tendency to take a recent experience and project and assume that it will continue into the future. And if you think about what that might mean for us now, I think about a couple of things, and that is that the path in will not be the same as the path out of this. Um, COVID environment and um, there's lots of reasons why we wouldn't want it to be. We had to respond and turn almost on a dime and move almost entire workforces uh, to home and as much work as possible for organisations to have being done in a virtual environment. Um, and a lot of that environment was um, quite heavily controlled and we were responding to regulation. Um, there will likely be more uncertainty as we take a path back, um, more, perhaps more empowerment for organisations to make decisions about um, what that looks like and when that can look like. And so that path in is not going to be the same as the path out, and nor um, do we want to be bouncing back. Um, and so, as I said at the opening, the opportunity is absolutely for us to think about how we bounce forward um, rather than bounce back. I love this quote um, from Scott and um, he talks about as leaders that we really need to fight the idea that the world um, can go back to the way it was. In fact, a few weeks ago there was some research and, uh, done out of the UK and only 9% of Brits wanted to go back to life and work the way it was. So we know that we know that in ourselves, we know that there's going to be demand for that from our people. Um, but I love how Scott talks about charting a path back to the known state, charting a path back to where we were is not leadership. Actually charting a path, which is the uncertain path, which is the unknown path to the way forward, that's what leadership is all about. And so really I wanna talk about what are the elements today that will help us to ensure personally and in our leadership, we're in the best possible state of being to help us to be able to um, move through the recovery stage and be able to thrive um, as we move into uh, whatever our new world uh, becomes and whatever we're leading in that space. Confidence. I love to start here because it's such so underpinning of everything that we need. Uh, because with confidence, we can do just about anything and without it, um, we are very limited. I love, and I've done a whole lot of research, as Joe said, for my book on confidence. The reason why I titled the book, The Power of Real Confidence is because the real part for me is this genuine, grounded confidence. Um, it's the confidence that starts from the inside um, and that people can often um, admire in you and make comments about, oh, they're confident. But the thing with confidence that I love most and what I found most empowering about confidence is that it's not something you're either born with or without. Confidence is, I liken it to um, like a muscle that we can build 
knowing the elements, um, just like when you go to the gym, you might work with a personal trainer and they can talk to you about all of the, the things that you might do at the gym to help um, build your muscles. Confidence, knowing what are the elements that um, it takes to build your confidence can be built over time. Um, and like um, building a muscle, it's not something that we do once. So we don't go to a gym, build, build our muscles and then say, right, you know, clap our hands together and say that that's done for the rest of my life now. I've built those muscles. Confidence is something that we need to be conscious of, be aware of. Um, we can have, um, it, it can be a little like a roller coaster ride in itself um, in that we can have dips in our confidence. Um, and so what I'm seeing at the moment is this environment, this roller coaster that many of us have been on, has caused some dints in confidence. I've had leaders say to me, um, am I leading in the right way? Am I focused on the right things? Um, what should I be doing right now? Which is a great question to be asking. Um, but really some of that is coming from um, some real uncertainty about you know, am I leading in the right way? Am I showing up in, in the right way for my organisation, for myself, for my people? So there's been some dints in confidence. So it's important to think about that as we position ourselves in the right way um, to take us forward. This is the, the confidence model that I created then as a result of the work on confidence and, um, and is right throughout the, the book. And what is important with confidence as we think about how we go about building confidence? And I, I think what might be most helpful today is to focus most on the how of this, um, is that we need to do work both internally and externally. So the work that we do internal for ourselves as we build our confidence will be evident externally for those who observe us. And there are four key components of this. The work that we do so that we show up as the best version of ourself and we can have um, the best chance of showing up with confidence. Um, the work that we do quite internally so that we can stand up um, with strength and confidence, how we speak up and how we step up. And if I think of all of those four components, they are as critical, if not more critical than ever right now. The work that we have to do when we're working from home, when we've got lots going on around us, you know, if we've been homeschooling, the different roles that we might have, the different setup that we have, um, the blurred boundaries, as I said, those, the work that we have to do to show up is even more important. Um, how we speak up is very different in this, um, in this virtual world. Our presence, our voice, um, is really different when we are um, speaking into um, a computer most of the time and um, engaging with people around us in a virtual way. Um, and step up, um, we'll have a look at that in a minute, and that's about our relationships and, um, and our mindset. And again, very critical that we are proactive um, about how we manage that and aware of the state that we're in. So I always start with show up because I think it is um, where we um, can have our best opportunity to be strong and confident if we're thinking about this space. The three elements of us showing up with confidence are strong, real and aware. Now strong is about um, our strengths, what we're great at and being really aware of that. But also what fits in the strong category is looking after ourselves. And as I said, more than ever, um, this is a time that we've had to put some different disciplines in place to make sure that the, the blurred boundaries don't get on top of us, um, to make sure that our working days are managed um, as much as possible. Um, I've spoken to many leaders over uh, the course of the last few months who are working longer hours than ever, that workload is higher than ever. And if I think about um, the, the many of the people uh, on this webinar that are in the HR community, you've been at the forefront of leading organisations through 
um, taking work from home, taking people to their homes, new policies, thinking about um, the risk cultures, thinking about all of the things that go with having to, um, had to respond to this very quickly. Um, and so long days, additional pressures, um, as well as you know, the business as usual environment of having to deliver. So thinking about our strengths, thinking about what we're great at, what gives us energy, and then, and then how we look after ourselves is really, really important in terms of our confidence. Because we know, and, and I, I know because I've had this conversation many, many times over the last few months and, and before, but you can see the, the um, consistency with people that are, have taken some time to think about what's their new operating rhythm for themselves, for their teams, and put some disciplines in place around, even if they're small habits, um, about getting out, getting some fresh air, getting some exercise each day um, to keep motivated and to keep energised through this period of time. But that will be really important for confidence as we go forward. The real, as I said earlier, is this genuine grounded sense of confidence. Um, and it links to when we talk about values and purpose in a minute. Um, so there is a big difference in confidence between, um, between arrogance and confidence. And so this, the confidence that we're talking about is the genuine confidence that will look different for different people. Um, so knowing what it is to really have that sense of strong sense of self that's very real for you. Um, and that links then with awareness. So self-awareness is a really big piece of that. And it's a really important piece of where we're at at the moment, uh, being able to check in with ourselves, being able to look inward, being able to understand if the week has felt like a roller coaster or the month has felt like a roller coaster, what have been my good days? What's contributed to my good days? How can I do more of that? The days that have not been great, then what have been the contributing causes? Perhaps I haven't got out at all. Perhaps I've done way too many back-to-back -back, um, Zoom meetings, you know, which certainly I have. And so therefore, as I start the new week, how can I do more of what's working for me, what's energising me, what's helping to sustain me and manage some of the other that um, is really detracting from that? So having a super high sense of awareness, um, but be, making that really genuine and real to who you are and leveraging your strengths as much as possible is really important for, um, for that first element of showing up. The second, and I always go to stand up next, um, values, purpose and resilience. Um, values, so what is core to you? And understanding that will really help us at a time that is challenged. Um, our purpose, I love the work actually that Margie Worrell does um, on purpose and she talks about purpose being the intersection between uh, what are you good at, what do you care about and what can you contribute, those simple elements. And I think um, far too often people think about this purpose as such um, a, a big floaty lofty goal of, of trying to find your ultimate purpose in life. Um, but actually just to think about, you know, what, what really um, is my purpose as I focus on the next few months ahead of me? What am I great at? What do I really care about? What's important for me right now and how am I contributing? And make purpose about what's in front of us right now rather than um, having to answer kind of an ultimate question around purpose. And resilience we know is critical for us. And this is where I think the opportunity is very much about bouncing forward rather than bouncing back in terms of our resilience and, and being able to manage that. And if we are really centered and grounded in our values, what we're about in terms of our purpose um, and our resilience and our, and our ability to um, look after ourselves and to um, and to be resilient and to move forward, then our ability to stand up with confidence um, is really heightened. The, uh, the virtual world has certainly um, changed uh, in terms of the, our voice and our presence and the impact we can have, and we need to think about that. I think what I saw 
right at the start in the first couple of months is everything went to, to Zoom and uh, or Skype or Teams. Everything went to a video environment um, and people got pretty exhausted. I certainly did by the end of the week. Um, in fact, it was probably by Wednesday afternoon and I was thinking, is it Friday yet? Um, and, and I think as time's gone on and we've um, normalised work a little bit more, we've found a better operating rhythm that is a mix of whether it's a call, whether it's um, a walking um, one-on-ones, which I love hearing about, whether it's video, but getting the right balance for you as a leader and for your teams has been really important. Um, I think about um, some of the executive meetings um, that I've either participated in or led or facilitated. Um, but certainly, you know, having a voice and um, maintaining your presence and impact is very different. So being thoughtful about that, being deliberate about how you're intervening um, in those kind of environments is really important. And, um, and really thinking about um, how you might approach that. And the challenge is when we are running back to back all day, and it might be back to back Zoom meetings all day, and we don't have the ability to pause and to create a little bit of space to be deliberate, to think about our contribution, to think about our point of view, then um, then we you know we we just stay on a treadmill and we are responding the way that we've always responded. Um, and now more than ever is a time, and, and Joe said it at the beginning, to, to pause, um, even if it's briefly as we go and think about, okay, what, what's going on here? What voice do I need to have? What is the opportunity in front of us? And how do I want to position that so that it has the right level of impact? And lastly, um, on, um, in the real confidence model is uh, our ability to step up. And again, critical right now, how we manage relationships, how we manage our brand as leaders um, and our mindset. And if I just focus on mindset for a minute, I'm going to talk shortly about some um, work that Deloitte's put out during this period um, where they've, um, uh, they've talked about three different mindsets for us as leaders through this period of time. And they talk about um, respond, recover and thrive. And the fact is for most people, we've been in respond mode, certainly right at the start of, um, of responding, of taking our work to home, um, of leading in um, a remote environment. We've been pretty much in respond mode. And um, for many people and many leaders, I see that um, a respond mindset is still where uh, where people are at. Um, recovery is being um, moving to that more proactive mindset where we're able to think about what the opportunity is for us to bounce forward. So I'll talk about that more in a minute, but actually acknowledging that the mindset that we've been in over the last few months, we've got to be proactive about shifting that so that we are able to, as leaders, create a path forward um, and be very deliberate about the organisation, the teams, the culture um, and the business that we want to set up into the future. So those four elements, I'll run through them pretty quickly from a time perspective, but thinking about how we, the work that we need to do for ourselves and for us as leaders to show up with confidence, um, they're really quite internal work that we need to have clarity on our values, our purpose, and building our resilience. Thinking about our voice and how we're having the right level of impact um, through this period of time and into creating impact for the future. And then how we're managing our relationships and our mindset um, at, through this and into the future as well are all of the elements of confidence. So um, I might just pause there uh, and just uh, see if there is anything on people's mind, particularly around confidence um, and how we're building that for ourselves and our people, um, or if there's something going on in the chat box. Alan. 
Yes, good timing, Michelle. Um, just literally had a comment from Kevin, who um, has just a comment, really. Another aspect to leaders giving a voice to their people is having a different approach for the quieter people, i.e., instead of expecting them to speak up for themselves, creating a nurturing environment and at appropriate moments asking for their input. I love that. Absolutely. I do. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think that is more important. Um, and in fact, we're seeing this as, as heightened through this period of time. And, you know, we talk about a burning platform for change. And when you think about some of the, the critical leadership qualities like um, building trusted environments and, and leading with compassion and care, um, giving voice to people, it, it's, it's more critical than ever. Um, and what this period has done that I see is expose those leaders that are doing that really well, but, but uh, it's also exposed those leaders that are doing it less well as, as well. So, but I, I think that is one of the elements when we talk about bouncing forward, giving voice to our people, building confidence in our people, um, knowing as leaders that we don't have all the answers. Um, and, and, and sometimes that takes a confidence to be able to say, you know, that's not, um, that my people have got this. And uh, rather than uh, kind of faking this confidence that uh, and thinking we need to show up as, you know, the, the holder of all of the answers, I think that's, it's definitely an old approach. Perfect. I think that's all the comments just now, Michelle. Okay, thanks, Alan. Okay. If I can move on to from confidence, then curiosity. Adaptive leadership is so critical. Um, and, you know, we speak about whether it's um, adaptation or creativity, innovation as being really important skills for, for us as leaders. And curiosity really is, um, underpins all of that. I love that quote from Ian Leslie, curiosity affects our brain's chemistry, helping us better learn and retain information. Um, I'm all about, um, and I get excited by the neuroscience of, of leadership. Um, and so it, really being able to practice curiosity through this period, will allow us to pause and think about what is our opportunity as we go forward? What is it that's going to be helpful for us um, to set us up um, in this opportunity to bounce forward? Um, when we talk about adaptive leadership and adaptation, we are a brilliant role model as a human species. Um, nature is, is you know, our best sign of adaptation. There's only 1% difference in DNA between an ape and a human. And um, you, when you look at that picture, you know, we've come a long way. Um, so I think, you know, adaptation is our opportunity, how we adapt and how we grow from here. But it's also a big challenge. We can't expect that we are just going to adapt, that it is just going to happen. Um, when we think about adaptation, then at its core, what's happen happening is... We keep stuff, we lose stuff, and we change stuff um, is basically what happens when we adapt. And if, uh, again, back to the 1% difference in DNA, what that tells us is that we keep a lot. So we don't need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. The fact is that our opportunity right now is to think about what all of the brilliant parts of our culture, our leadership, our people, how we respond and provide service to our customers, our community. Um, what is really critical to us as an organisation that we need to keep? That at all costs, we will not let go. Um, and that is a really important component of, um, of adaptation. And we need to be curious to be able to think about that. Um, I think our biggest risk or one of our biggest risks is when we are exhausted and stressed and um, a lot of the things that have been um, challenging us through this period of time is when we are responding in that way we'll always do what we've always, what we've always done 
Um, and so getting us in a better place so that we're able to be curious is really important. The next question for us is what do we need to lose? What no longer works for us? And therefore, what will losing something help us to do in terms of adaptation? And what do we need to change or innovate? Again, without curiosity, it's really difficult to be asking ourselves those questions. I love the work of Carol Dweck and she um, has uh, perfectly articulated how growth mindset will be able to support getting us in the right place for us to go forward, for us to be able to spend more time listening and learning um, and compromising, being humble and compassionate um, is really important. It's going to help us to think about the problems that we need to solve. It's going to help us to um, have a fail fast mindset to experiment more. These will be really important components of how we go forward um, and how we leverage um, the curiosity. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the... Um, a couple of the most important leadership skills in the adaptive leadership space is our ability to observe and interpret. And I think, again, when we're on the treadmill and we're tired and we're stressed, what I see most often happens is that we go straight to intervening, we go straight to responding in a way that we have always responded, in a way that we know works for us. But if we are in response mode and working and leading in a way that we've always done, we'll get what we've always got. So the likelihood of us then leading our organisation back to where we were is heightened. So the, the skills of observation and interpretation will be really important. And that's just probably understanding what curiosity could look like for leaders that little bit more. This is the work of, uh, of Deloitte. Um, as I said, the, the three mindsets that they articulated through this period of time was respond, recover and thrive. And it's not, um, it, it, it's not, um, it, we, we've been in the response mode and that's where we've had to be. We've had to turn on a dime to, to move our work and our people there are increasingly um, people and leaders and conversations that are being had right now that are starting to turn to recover. But recover doesn't just look like building a path to the future. Recover also looks like thinking about what are the keep, lose, innovate components? What um, is our chance to build a culture that will set this organisation, this business up for success in the coming years? What is our opportunity right now that we actually didn't think that we had before? So recover is a very proactive mindset that is more than just the technical components of building a path back, but it is actually building the adaptive components to this um, opportunity to bounce forward. And then as Deloitte articulated, thrive is the mindset for, um, that, that we need to have for us when we are in our future world. So what mindset do we need to be in to help us to really optimise the, the world that we're building now for the future? And I think those two quotes that come from Deloitte um, I like both of them. I tried to pick between the two to share today, but I like them both because one is about um, leaders and shifting our mind from today to tomorrow as leaders, as individuals. And then the other one is a more organisation. So when we think about as we shift our mind from today to tomorrow, what will that enable? And enable an organisation that has... Um, if we put the right disciplines in place now, if we put the right, if we, if we are deliberate about what we are keeping, what we are losing, what we are innovating, we've got the opportunity to build um, these new elements into our DNA and therefore set our organisations up for a different future. So 
Um, so curiosity, there's a lot in this. Um, there's a lot that we need to do to set ourselves up and to enable the curiosity, to press the pause button, to create some space, to um, ask ourselves the question what it's time for, to observe what's going on in the system around us, um, to interpret what that might mean and pause before we respond the way that we've always responded, to think about um, with a growth mindset, how might I try some different things? How might I experiment with a different way forward? Um, and these can be very practical things. These can be things like, um, I've got a, uh, I'm gonna have a conversation with the board about um, reducing our board papers from eight pages to two pages is a conversation I had with a CEO only a few weeks ago. And then he went on to say, well, if we can do a two page board paper through this period of time, then why couldn't we always do a two page board paper? So pausing and being, um, being observant and being curious enough to say, what's a new way of doing this? Or do we even have to do this? Um, and then being able to think about what we need to take forward or what we deliberately want to take forward in terms of keeping losing and innovating um, in our opportunity to bounce forward. And again, I'll pause just to see um, if we've got some chat or questions about curiosity. Um, not about curiosity, I did just a little step back, uh, Michelle, uh, comment with everyone being so busy and working harder and longer, uh, are we perhaps losing that opportunity for adaption? Adapta adaption, adaptation, sorry. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. And that's where um, we have to think about the treadmill we're on because longer, harder, um, as challenging as it is, the opportunity to create some space. So um, what I, when I'm coaching, what I often say to leaders is, how can you be very conscious of the mental space that you're creating for yourself? Even if you are running back to back all day, can you create 15 minutes every 90 minutes to reflect on the conversations you've had, um, reflect on um, the work that needs to be done, what it's time for, etc. So even when it's completely challenging with longer hours and um, tiredness, some small things are still critical um, in terms of creating the space. Can you create, can you create um, 45 minute meetings rather than one hour meetings? So you've got 15 minutes to regroup, reset, and have a thought about what is it that you're facing into in the next meeting? Because the likelihood is when we're going longer and harder is that we will possibly lose that opportunity to be curious and um, to think about what we need to keep, lose and innovate um, and therefore potentially lose the opportunity for adaptation. So I think it's a really good call. Um, but we don't, need to, um, we don't need to be perfect about it. I'm going to talk about some of the small things that we can do towards the end. I think um, if we set the bar too high, we're likely to choke ourselves at the moment in terms of, um, of, of doing these things perfectly. And I, my mantra to myself and what I use often with others is progress, not perfection through this. So if we can each week think about, you know, how we're showing up and how we're going to create some of that space a little bit differently than we might've done the last week, then that's a good thing. Great, fantastic, thank you. Um, yep, that's that's pretty much it for the moment on, on the chat. Oh, I've got another one, sorry. Sorry, Michelle, I'll jump in here. Uh, Paul's just said, do you think the longer, harder issues is a compensating mode for the change? To me, it feels like we are justifying our new way of working because of a lack of trust. Uh, can you just read that again, Alan, sorry? Sure, sure. So do you think the longer, harder issues is a compensating mode for the change, question mark. To me, it feels like we are justifying our new way of working because of a lack of trust. Yeah, that, yeah there's a lot in that. Um, it's really interesting. One of the um, most often asked questions that I had at in the early weeks of 
um, of working from home was how we're going to manage performance and how we're going to um, understand if people are doing what they need to be doing. And um, as it's panned out, what we know is that it's been much more a question of managing overwork and overload and helping to, to lead teams so that we are supporting motivation and energy. But certainly those early questions go to the heart of trust. So I, I do think to that point is um, for those leaders that are not leading in a way that builds trust, that is um, connecting kind of human to human, we're going to talk about connection next, then um, often what happens is the, the delegation is challenged. Um, they're trying to prove their worth by way of, you know, doing lots of, of the work. Um, so it trust is a, is a very big element in this, I totally agree. And so, you know, to me that then still comes back to our self-awareness, you know, and um, what are we picking up? Why are we doing that? Um, is this the right um, work for me to be doing as a leader? How have I set up my team? Is this something I can give the thinking as well as the doing to my team to help grow them through this period of time. You know, but as, as uh, that comment came through, that takes trust. Um, and so, you know, it, it is a very big component of this. So I move on, Alan, with no more questions. Um, yep, that's okay. All good to move on. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the last component, I, I think, picks up what the, la the last couple of comments have been as well, and this, it's this compassion um, and, you know, the, some of the, the cousins, I would call, of compassion that are equally as important for our leadership right now, kindness, empathy, um, some of the other elements of our EQ, which are critical in terms of, of how we're showing up how we're leading, but how we're going to be thinking about our opportunity to bounce forward. Uh, if I think about um, connection, it, connection is critical for, it's critical for trust. And, and I'm talking about a genuine connection um, where we, we truly care about our people. We truly care about, um, you know, what, that all of the elements of our organisation to, in terms of our customers and our community as well. We care for ourselves. Um, curiosity comes into there as well, which we've already spoken about. And humility to me comes back to this where I talked about the grounded confidence that is also fueled and balanced with humility um, so that um, with, with it, this arrogance or ego doesn't get in our way. Um, what connection gives us in terms of what the, the neuroscience of this as well is it fuels us with um, a whole lot, lot of um, oxytocin, our feel-good chem chemicals, so it gives us the warm and fuzzies. Um, and uh, when we do something kind, when we are compa show compassion to our people, um, what that does for us, um, uh, you know, can't be replaced. Uh, building up others has a funny way of making us stronger. So if we have a look at what's actually going on when we are exercising leadership with compassion or being compassionate, whether that's to ourselves or to others, um, and how that fuels our brain and therefore puts us in a great state to take us forward. We've got this prefrontal cortex, I always kind of touch the top of my head when I talk about the prefrontal cortex, our thinking brain, and that is so critical for our performance as leaders. It's where all of our decision making, it's where our um, problem solving, it's strategizing, all of that work is done in our prefrontal cortex. The limbic part of our brain is our feeling brain. And if we reflect on perhaps even the last week and the emotions that we've felt over the last week, there's a lot that's been going on in our feeling brain. And in fact, um, when we're having conversations with people and talking about the roller coaster, that roller coaster is going on mostly in our feeling brain. The amygdala is where our flight, fight, um, 
freeze response comes from, and there's been plenty of that going on over the last few months. Um, it's where our, it's our threat detector basically in our brain. Um, and we've had many reasons for that threat detector, that amygdala to be really heightened. I uh, often think about um, the analogy of cars when I, when, uh, I talk about the, our brain, particularly for leadership with our people. Um, and the prefrontal cortex is very, needs a lot of fuel to function. So I liken that to a Lamborghini. So we need to be thinking about how we're fueling our prefrontal cortex um, regularly. It's said that we wake up with about two hours fuel in our prefrontal cortex in the morning. So um, we've had a good night's sleep, um, although sometimes that's been compromised at the moment, um, but we wake up with about two hours fuel. So we have to think about what we do through the course of the day to enable that prefrontal cortex to be well fueled. And if I link that back to all of the things that I've said, that um, when we're fueling our prefrontal cortex, we're able to be curious. We're able to think about how we're showing up we're able to build our resilience if we've got the right fuel in that prefrontal cortex. Our limbic brain is easier, it's more like a smart car. So we have a good night's sleep, our memories are stored, um, and uh, you know, that is less fuel intensive. But we need our feeling and our thinking brains to be working well in alignment. And we are, and we are exercising leadership in a way that is compassionate and kind, um, Two things happen when the oxytocin floods into the brain, then it releases the feel-good chemical, and that is fuel for our thinking brain. So um, we think about fuel differently, and connection and compassion fuels our thinking brain. And when that's fuel, we're able to be more empathetic. So it's, uh, it's kind of self-fulfilling in lots of ways. We connect well with people, we build trust, um, to the previous comment, we are kind and compassionate and we care and that fuels our brain but gives us fuel to, to, um, to lead with more empathy. So all of these things are important but the question then is what are some of the simple things we can be doing right now to be fueling our thinking brain um, and really the basics are three, sleep, nutrition, um, and good food and, and exercise, as well as the um, ability to connect, which, which I've said. So if I just start with connection, that has been somewhat compromised over the last few months when we haven't been able to connect with family and friends in the same way. Um, there's been lots of creative ways that I've seen um, having parties and dinner parties and um, house parties and um, things virtually. I've heard lots of people tell me that they're connecting far more with families overseas, uh, checking in, um, making sure families are okay. Um, but so, so that is an important, really important um, way that we refuel, but it has been challenged. Um, even, uh, you know, I'm a hugger. So uh, part of my connection, I, I was assumed, comes with a hug. Um, and so for me, it just feels wrong right now when we're starting to connect with other people, a family and friends and people we love, um, and we see them when we can't hug them. Um, I was out with a friend um, the other day and she said, well, she's not a hugger. And so she said, it suits her perfectly to not have people hugging her all the time. Um, and so I'm sure you, you will have felt that one way or another. But that connection is absolutely a way to fuel that um, prefrontal cortex to build the ability to um, connect, trust and have compassion. Sleep, um, important. Some people are finding that um, particularly challenging through the last few months. Um, so be thinking about what you can do to, um, to improve the quality, um, if not the quantity of sleep is really important. And again, progress, not perfection. So small things that you could do, what can you do this week um, where you were perhaps a bit compromised last week, what routines might you need to put in place, what tiny habits that you might need to put in place to help you to show up um, as the best version of you and be able to capture some of these opportunities in front of us. Um, 
as I said, we wake up with two hours fuel in the prefrontal cortex at the start of the day. And so having some of the smaller breaks, if you can create 15 minutes every 90 minutes to create some opportunities to have just have a healthy snack, to make sure that you do have periods through the day that you're able to have something to eat, um, perhaps well some prepared um, meals for lunch. I've talked to lots of people who are going right through lunch, not eating. I might have a four o'clock meeting with someone and they're just, they've got their lunch to the side that they haven't even got to yet. So those are things that, you know, when we have gone through a day and we, our sleep's been compromised, um, we haven't yet had a chance to have anything other than a coffee. By three o'clock, if you're in a meeting and you've been going back to back, your ability to observe, to be curious, to be compassionate is really compromised. So small things that are helpful just to refuel. And lastly, exercise. And I say to people right now, again, progress, perhaps exercise if your day is completely full, um, it might not allow for it, but can you take five minutes to get some fresh air? For those of you who are in Melbourne, we've got a, it, albeit freezing, but uh, we've got a, a sunny day today and I think it's sunny up in Sydney as well. Um, so even to take five minutes um, and get some fuel from the sunshine is really important. So taking some moments, taking some pauses through the course of your day, through the course of your week to think about how am I fueling my brain for better leadership? How am I being compassionate? Um, how am I um, connecting with people? How am I looking after and sustaining myself so that I'm able to really capture this opportunity to be able to bounce forward? I love this quote, what got us here won't get us there. Um, and whether that is about the path back, uh, sorry, the, the path forward versus the path into this, um, whether it's about us as individuals. I use this really frequently as a, as a thought for myself and my mindset to think about what got me to this point in my life is not necessarily going to be what um, all of the things that uh, take us forward. It reinforces the keep, lose and innovate. So, you know, there's loads of things that has helped us be successful to this point. Um, but there'll be some new things that we need to bring in, whether that's a, a new um, discipline for yourself to be able to sustain your energy and your motivation, whether that's a new way of leading or delegating, sharing, building trust, um, whether that's some additional elements that you need to do to build your confidence. But for us to get into a state personally and as leaders to feel that um, our sense of self is strong and our inner confidence is strong, that we're curious and thoughtful and observant about the opportunities in front of us and that we are um, exercising and showing up in a way that is kind and compassionate um, and fueled with trust and, and um, will allow us to pause and to reflect and to capture uh, the opportunity that is in front of us right now. So I, I will pause for the last time, Alan, and, uh, and see what might be on people's minds. Sure thing. Well, I do have a question, uh, Michelle, from Joanna. Um, one of the challenges in truly leveraging the opportunities in this recovery phase is the spectrum of leadership appetite for doing things differently. Um, is there any advice on how, on how to take those resistant in to doing those changes? So any advice on how to take those resistant to doing, if that makes sense, i.e. Yeah. doing things differently? Yeah, and I think this goes to some of the heart of growth mindset as well, you know, the fail fast. And, and uh, we were just actually having a chat um, before the participants came on today about how um, it's, it's okay to say experiment and do things differently. But um, if, if your organisation or culture or um, the leaders at the top of the organisation are resistant to that, it's pretty challenging. Um, so... Um, that's where, um, in, you know, real influence, thinking about your influence and impact come into that. 
Um, I, I often think um, I studied adaptive leadership at Harvard and the influence model that we um, studied there was to think about um, what do you, though those that you're um, wanting to influence differently, what do they care about? Who do they care about? And what might they be afraid of or worried about? So taking a pause to think about if you're wanting to do something different, um, if you're wanting to experiment, if you're wanting to um, think about some of these elements around um, what you want to try differently, then those people that you're trying to influence, then what do they care about? Um, what might they be worried about if you were trying to lead differently um, or put something different or new in place? And then coming from that perspective first, um, that would be because ultimately it's an influence challenge um, and there will be many. Thanks so much, yeah. Michelle. Um, I, uh, I've just uh, picked up your book again to um, just have a look at your, uh, your confidence model, etc. because that was just so powerful. And just to remind all the participants, we will be e emailing out the slides, uh, or Michelle actually will be emailing out the slides next, next week, and I'm sure will be delighted to speak in more detail. And it was interesting when you were talking about that, um, you know, what got us here won't get us out. And I think that that's even relevant for the roller coaster moments as well and acknowledging that you know it's okay to be in that that period in that moment and but you will move forward from it and uh, and that's that mindset just getting yourself in that mindset of there will be opportunities to to move out of it and I love that phrase you know progress not perfection I think Sometimes we're probably putting a lot of uh, expectations on ourselves and hence the longer hours, the working harder, maybe not smarter because we're realising some of these macro factors are so big at the moment, but we're not going to be solving them in a few hours or overnight. It's that uh, progress, not perfection and just slow increments perhaps. Absolutely, Jo. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Michelle. That was absolutely wonderful and um, some real little hints and tips. I definitely, I really resonated with me the 90 minutes and give myself 15 minutes to kind of re regroup as somebody that tends to go a million miles per hour. So thank you so, so much for sharing your, your knowledge and your, and your insights. And uh, we will look forward to posting the webinar and the, uh, and the slides up on our website next week. Um, but thank you everybody for, for joining us. Uh, next week, uh, as a learning table, we will have Paul Catrone, uh, who is a legal profession, who will be sharing uh, from a, a legal and risk perspective some of the things that we need to be thinking about uh, within the whole return to the workspace. So looking forward to that one as well. Thanks, Michelle. See you Have soon. Fun. See you.